and he himself, he could have gone earlier. He seemed to have this desire to be back in Jerusalem and to be working and doing the priesthood. But verse 10 gives us insight into why it's this moment that he waited for. Welcome to Uncaged Bible Study. We hope our name gives it away as we are looking to unleash God's word in its entirety from beginning to end and unlock the power within the pages of scripture. We aim to restore the authority of God's word in a world that has lost its understanding of doctrinal truths as well as shed a light on how from the first page to the last page, the Bible is pointing us towards Messiah, our Savior, Jesus. So we hope you enjoy the Bible study today. And if you did, follow us or share the podcast to help us spread the word around the globe. And if you leave us a five-star review, that's a great way to let us know that you say amen and are impacted by what you've heard. So thank you for joining us on this journey. And in the words of Charles Spurgeon, the Bible is like a caged lion. It does not need to be defended. It simply needs to be let out of its cage. Let's unlock the cage together. So we're in chapter 7 of Ezra. We recently did the first six chapters. We did them in two separate meetings because the book of Ezra, as I see it, is kind of broken into three separate events. The first three chapters really cover the Israelites as they were exiled in Babylon as Persia takes over. They now have, from King Cyrus, the ability to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so the first three chapters really cover that King Cyrus is kind to his subjects, the Jews, and he allows them and writes a decree for them to go back and rebuild their temple and start doing proper worship again in their city after being exiled for 70 years. Now, That Those first three chapters cover Zerubbabel and Joshua. Zerubbabel is a descendant of David, a descendant of Jehoiachin, the most recent king on the throne of Jerusalem. So he's a a member of the royal lineage, and he's in the lineage of the Messiah. And he leads the people back to Jerusalem along with the high priest Joshua. And that is the first three chapters. The next three chapters, chapters 4 through 6, is 16 years later. Because after their initial zeal, they build the foundation and the altar so that they have the bare minimum to do sacrifices. But then they have some opposition from people close by and they get a little scared and they get really focused on their own safety and security and they stop building the temple. And 16 years go by before they finish finish their work. At that point, chapters 4 through 6, is a companion to the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. They exist at that time, 16 years after they have come back to rebuild the temple, and the temple still lays in ruins. It only has the foundation and the altar. And Haggai, in particular, is the prophet who motivates Zerubbabel and Joshua to get the people together and motivate them to finish their work. They spend a significant amount of time building the temple, and they finish it in a couple of years. Now, chapter 7 is nearly 60 years later from that moment. They have finished the temple. Zerubbabel and Joshua are no longer characters in the rest of the story. And in between chapter 6 and 7 is the entire book of Esther and the entire reign of King Xerxes. And then you get to chapter 7, and this is where Ezra actually enters the scene. Up until this point, he's just been recording history. Now Ezra is actually recording experience, because he is now the one leading another group of people back to Jerusalem. And Ezra is a scribe. He's a, he's a descendant of Aaron. He's of the lineage of the high priest. And he is used as a teacher and ultimately what becomes the role of rabbi later on in Jewish history is what Ezra is. 
He's sort of the prime example of what a good rabbi is supposed to be and what a good scribe is. And so this is where he comes into the story. In chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Now after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, this is Xerxes' son, or as he's known in the book of Esther, Ahasuerus. King Artaxerxes is his son, king of Persia. Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Mariath, the son of Zariah, the son of Uzai, the son of Buki, I don't know if that's right, the son of Abishua, the son of Phineas. That's where it gets important. The son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. And so Phineas is mentioned in the book of Numbers, and he had uh, a pretty cool story where he uh, attacked those with a spear who were opposing true worship. Uh, and he is the grandson of Aaron, like Moses and Aaron from the Exodus. And so Ezra is from that lineage. That's all that, that's telling us. It says, This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given the king, uh, had given the king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord, uh, his God upon him. Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach the statutes and ordinances of Israel. So ultimately what this is all saying is Ezra is leading a group of people back to Jerusalem. Now in the first wave, there was only about 50,000 Jews that came back to Jerusalem. Now there's a whole, it's about 80 years after that first wave of people came, 60 years after the temple is built. And Ezra is now bringing this other wave of people who are interested in going back to Jerusalem and being honoring to God. And he himself, he could have gone earlier. He seemed to have this desire to be back in Jerusalem and to be working and doing the priesthood. But verse 10 gives us insight into why it's this moment that he waited for. Because Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach the statutes and ordinances of the law. So there's three big things about Ezra and who he is and how this moment was made for him. First of all, he didn't return in haste, he first prepared his heart to be able to, to do it. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. So he was working in his own heart to be in love with Scripture and to understand it to the fullest of his ability before he returned. Not only to understand it, but it also says, and to do it. Not just to understand the words, but to live by them. And then the third thing is to be a teacher. He also wanted to teach the statutes and the ordinances of Israel. So Ezra is going back to Jerusalem, not just for himself and out of his heart to be a worshiper, but with a goal. Ezra himself wants to understand the law, to be an example of someone who lives by it, and to know it well enough to be able to teach others what they are supposed to do as sort of a revival moment in Jerusalem. And so now in verse 11, we get a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra as he heads back to do this task. Uh, and he is an expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. That's how it starts. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra, the priest, a scribe of the law of God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. I issue a decree that all of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. And whereas you are being sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God, which is in your hand, 
And whereas you carry the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, who's dwelling in Jerusalem. So it starts out with the normal political, nice, soft talk that you give to each other. But then he's saying that Artaxerxes is sending all of the people with Israel who choose to volunteer to go. But not just that, but also Artaxerxes is offering up silver and gold to the God of Israel to try to appease this God. You'll see how this goes. This is a very pagan way of thinking. He's thinking the land of Israel has its own God, as if the God of Israel is only over Israel. Like, that's the only area that he controls. And he doesn't want to offend part of the country that he owns. And so he's trying to appease that God to not see any issues with that part of his land that he, he controls. Not realizing that he's really offering to a, the God of the entire world and the universe. But that's the motivation, and he's sending Ezra to do this. Verse 16, And whereas all the silver and gold that you may find in all the province of Babylon, along with the freewill offering of the people and the priests, are to be freely offered for the house of their God in Jerusalem. Now, therefore, be careful to buy with this money bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. And whatever seems good to you and your brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, do it according to the will of your God. Now you get some insight into what the king thought of Ezra. The king gave total authority over all of this silver and gold and all of this, just all these goods and wealth. He gave Ezra oversight to do with it what he saw out to do what he thought was best. And so he has total authority on how to spend Persia's money. Um, Ezra is a better man than I. Verse 19, also the articles that are given to you for the service of the house of your God deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have occasion to provide, Pay for it from the king's treasury. So he's also saying, if you need anything else, ask. I'll give it to you. I mean, this is Persia was a pretty wealthy king. It's not Solomon money, but it's good. You know, it's a lot of money. Verse 21, And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river that whatever Ezra the the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, may require of you, let it be done diligently. So now to the Persian authorities in Jerusalem, they have to listen to Ezra. Up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt without prescribed limit. Unlimited salt. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligent. Let it diligently be done for the house of God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the kings and his sons? So you get his motivation. This is all about, I want to make sure I'm not offending the God of the people that are under my control. Verse 24. Also we inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, Nethanim, or servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to your God-given wisdom, wisdom, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond, beyond the river. All such as know the laws of your God and teach those who do not know them. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily on him, whether it be death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. Now, this last part, it's unique. It gives me, turns my stomach a little bit. Basically, Artaxerxes the king is giving Ezra authority and telling all of the Persian authorities that they have to listen to whatever the law of God is in the land. And through political persuasion, not just religious authority, but political authority, if you do not follow the laws of the God of Israel within Jerusalem, 
you are to experience whatever the punishment is in the law of Moses. So capital punishment is now on play, um, but it's not through the temple authorities. It's through Persian authority are going to follow through on whatever the punishments in the Bible are. Um, you can see some good and bad in that. But what tends to happen is when it's politically persuaded that people do what's right out of fear of punishment from the government rather than out of devotion to God and their faith wanes and it becomes more of a checklist, right? So remember how you were asking last week, how did they become more legalistic as opposed to devout? This was probably the beginning of that, right? Because they were now doing things at the behest of the government rather than out of divine, uh, rather than out of genuine faith. So verse 27, blessed be the Lord God of our fathers who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem and has extended mercy to me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. So I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord God was upon me and I gathered leaning, leading men of Israel to go up with me. So now Ezra is going to leave Babylon and head back to Jerusalem. And that's where we pick up in chapter 8. It says, These are the heads of the fathers' houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes. Now, <clears throat> the rest of this is literally just a list and the amounts of people who are going to go with Ezra. Uh, so feel free to read through that, but for time's sake, I'm going to skip down to section 15 through 21. This is a list of the people of the people who initially volunteered uh, to go with Ezra. In verses 15 through 20, what you find out is as they were on their way to go, they realized that none of the Levites were among the people. And since Ezra didn't know how many priests were already in Jerusalem, he says, wait, we actually need to have members of the priesthood come to Jerusalem with us so that we can have proper worship when we go. And so they wait and they hold back. And then verses 15 through 20 are Ezra gathering members of the priesthood and members of the tribe of Levi to serve in the priesthood to go with him. And then we pick up in verse 21. It says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, so after all this, as they're preparing their way to go back to Jerusalem and they're on their way to Jerusalem, Ezra decides it's time to fast because he's concerned about the spiritual well-being of Jerusalem and the place he's going back to kick off this revival. It says that we might, be, we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. So what is Ezra telling us. Not only is he fasting in preparation for Jerusalem and what he wants to do there, but also Ezra has control of how this money gets spent. The king had already asked Ezra if they wanted an escort of soldiers because they're heading all the way from Babylon to Jerusalem and along the way it wasn't uncommon for people to experience raiders and trying to collect whatever goods you have for their own wealth and, and just pick off and, and loot whatever was going on in a caravan. So now Ezra is saying, we're fasting because I've already denied getting soldiers to protect us because this is a mission from God and God will protect us. And now he's thinking through the ramifications of that. This long travel with loads of silver and gold and livestock, all of these things that would be precious to anyone who sees them on the way. And now he's fasting and praying, seeking for God's protection on the way to protect 
what the king trusted him with, because if he loses it, he's basically admitting to the king that God isn't everything Ezra said he was to Artaxerxes. And so his motivation is to show Artaxerxes how good God really is and that what he said about him is true. So they're fasting. Verse 24, I separated 12 of the leaders of the priests, uh, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and 10 of their brethren with them, and weighed out to them the silver and gold and the articles, the offering of the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his princes and all Israel who were present had offered. I weighed into their hand 650 talents of silver, silver articles weighing 100 talents, 100 talents of gold, 20 gold basins worth 1,000 drachmas, and two vessels of fine polished bronze, precious as gold. As I said to them, you are holy to the Lord, the articles are holy, and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering to the Lord God of your fathers. Watch and keep them until you weigh them before the leaders of the priests and the Levites, heads of the fathers, houses of Israel and Jerusalem, in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites received the silver and the gold uh, and the articles by weight to bring them to Jerusalem, to the house of God. So this is Ezra's plan. Everything's weighed out and inventory is taken, and specific amounts of weight are given to different groups that are coming back with him. When they get back to Jerusalem, everyone is going to weigh everything they brought with them, and it should add up to the same amount. But they're separating all of the goods, so it's not just one giant pile of silver and one giant pile of gold as they're traveling through this route. Does that make sense? So he's thinking. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambush along the road. So we came to Jerusalem and stayed there three days. So when they got back to Jerusalem, they were safe from any raiders and looters, and they had everything they brought with them. So God protected them as Ezra thought he would. Now on the fourth day, the silver and the gold and the articles were weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the priest. And with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas. With them were the Levites, um, Josabad, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, the son of Benui. With the number and weight of everything, all the weight was written down at that time. The children of those who had been carried away captive had come from their captivity, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, 12 male goats as a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord, and they delivered the king's orders to the king's satraps and the governors in the region beyond the river. So they gave support to the people and the house of God. So they made it. Everything was as it should be, and they offer sacrifices to God and then give the instructions to the authorities from Persia in the region so that they know they have to listen to Ezra and they're able to have whatever they need to finish the work. Now Ezra is back in Jerusalem, and he is looking at the state of things. Now there was zeal 80 years ago when people came back to build the temple, and they were looking to worship freely and accurately again. And they lost their zeal, and they got discouraged. But 16 years later, God raises up the prophet Haggai and gets Joshua and Zerubbabel back on task and the people back on task. And now they're thrilled. They have, a, they have a new temple. They've been made promises by Haggai, and they institute temple worship, and it's, and it's back. But now it's nearly 60 years later again, and the state of things is what Ezra is noticing as he's brought back a brand new wave of people from Babylon. Chapter 9, when these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. With respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the people of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. So what he finds out, is that the people have not stayed true to their word and they haven't stayed true to the law of Moses and they've intermarried 
with the surrounding peoples, which was forbidden by God because the surrounding countries, not because of their race, but because of their faith. They lacked faith in the God of Israel, and they had faith in pagan gods. And the whole point with Sol we saw this with Solomon. When he married foreign women, he started giving his heart over to their pagan gods. And so now Ezra sees this, and he's worried that they're going to repeat the same mistakes they made before the exile. All of these people have intermarried with the surrounding region uh, and are taking in practices from the pagan gods in the surrounding region. That's where he starts. So Ezra says, so when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. So not only did he tear his garments in anguish, he tore out some of his hair and his beard, which is excruciatingly painful. And he weeps. He says, then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. So he's flabbergasted and upset, but a whole group of people assembled around him because they felt the same weight of disappointment. At the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting, having torn my garment and robe. I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. Now that's that proper, that proper worship position, right? He's on his knees, his hands are up to God, and he's looking down. And he said, oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you. My God, and this is important, Ezra's humility. Now Ezra's coming back with zeal, having spent time preparing himself, studying the word of God, and doing his best to be an example of someone to, who follows it. But listen to how he talks about the people around him who have failed. He says this, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty, and for our iniquities, we, our kings, and our priests have delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation, as it is this day. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place and that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. So Ezra, as he's reaching out and praying, he's not pointing the finger. He lumps himself in with everyone, recognizing that sin is the human condition of all. He doesn't see himself as above anybody else, even though he's going there to teach these people and to start a revival. He doesn't put himself on a pedestal. In fact, he's the one on his knees humbled before God, not even willing to look up at God's face. And he's saying, him included in the sin and iniquity from the beginning. And then he counts God's mercy and how God has given them this chance for revival, to rebuild, to make the temple more beautiful, to go back to true worship. And he's asking for this chance. Verse 10, and now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you command by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land with the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands with their abominations, which have filled it from the one and to another with their impurity. Now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it as an uninheritance for your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds 
and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such deliverance at this, should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us? You had consumed us so that there would be no remnant or survivor. O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. And so he's heartbroken. He's looking for another chance. And he's, he uses scripture in his prayer. He points out God's law and what they've broken as he's confessing to God what's going on. And what he's saying is reminiscent of things that Jesus said. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Can you tie your heart to someone who will drag you down? You're likely to be dragged down. That will happen to you. Gravity works in one direction. You get dragged down, it's a lot harder to pull someone up. And it's the same thing here. Don't get involved with the foreign nations around you because they're pagans and they will drag you down. It doesn't mean that God forbids it because we have already gone through books like Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite who came and followed Naomi to Bethlehem and Boaz married her. And they're in the lineage of Jesus. What God is saying is don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't allow yourself to be dragged down by the world because you will be dragged down more so often then you will be able to pull them up. It's just a biblical principle. In the final final chapter of the book of Ezra, now while Ezra was praying, while he was confessing, weeping and bowing down before the house of God, a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel. And for the people wept very bitterly. So the people were actually responding. Ezra was his eyes down, praying out to God, confessing. The people heard what he was saying, and their repentance is already starting as, as Ezra is confronting them with his confession. And they come and gather around him in support. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, and one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and we have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is a hope in Israel in spite of this. So Ezra confesses, and now other people are confessing. Now notice, Ezra wasn't pointing the finger at them. He was confessing sin to God, and including lumping himself in that. But other people heard it and got convicted by that and confessed as well. Now therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all of these wives to those who have been born to them according to the advice of my master and to those who tremble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Arise for this matter is your responsibility. We, are, we also are with you. Be of good courage and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leaders of the priests, the Levites, and all Israel swear an oath that they would do according to this word. So they swore an oath. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of, Jeho of Jehohanan and the son of Eliashib. And when he came there, he ate no bread and drank no water, for he mourned because of the guilt of those from the captivity. Ezra is still fasting on behalf. This is, what a spiritual leader. And they issued a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the descendants of the captivity that they must gather at Jerusalem and that whoever would not come within three days according to the instructions of the leaders and elders, all his prosperity would be confiscated. He himself would be separated from the assembly and those from the captivity. <clears throat> so Ezra is leading this revival and cleaning things out. People have repented and they've decided they need to, they need to do this and they need to do this in accordance with the law and they need to break the ties to the, the pagan nations and go all in on focusing on on God. And so now he's setting the parameters. So all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered at Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the 20th of the month. And all the people sat in the open square of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of heavy rain. So it's part of the cold. It's the cold part of the year. It's raining. It's cold. People are cold and they're sitting out 
trembling because of God, but also because they're cold. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and have taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the pagan wives. And so he is now instructing and teaching and telling them what they need to do. And all the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, loud voice, Yes, as you have said, so we must do. But, so this is an issue. Even when people agree that they're doing the wrong thing and they know they need to fix it, they're still machines of excuses. <laughs> and here it comes. But there are many people. It is the season for heavy rain. And we are not able to stand outside, nor is this the work of one or two days, for there are many of us who have transgressed in this matter. Please let the leaders of our entire assembly stand and let all those in our cities who have taken pagan wives come at appointed times together with the elders and judge their cities until the fierce wrath of our God is turned away from us in this matter. Only Jonathan, the son of uh, Azahel, and Jehaziah, the son of Tikva, opposed this, and Meshulam and Shabbatai, the Levite, gave them support. So the people complained and said, we can't do this so fast. We've got to take our time. There's too many of us who have screwed up. We've got to do this orderly. And so let's pick appointed times and help people create the divorce papers and separate us. And They come up with excuses. It's cold outside. It's raining a lot. There's a lot to do. We can't do this now. And then everyone gives support but a few people. Then the descendants of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest, with certain heads of, thought of the father's households, were set apart by the father's households, each of them by name, and they sat down on the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. By the first day of the first month, they finished questioning all the men uh, who had taken pagan wives. So within a few months, they finally gone through this process and questioned everyone and taken care of the matter. And among the sons of the priests who had taken pagan wives, the following were found of the sons of Joshua, the son of Josadak, and his brothers. And the rest of this chapter is now a list of the members of the priesthood who took pagan wives, and we're clearing that out. Now, this is the interesting part. They're all listed. Now, the rest of the tribes of Israel who were there, not listed. But the Levites, who in particular had extra access to the law, were supposed to be those following it to serve in the priesthood, did not do it, and all of them are listed because of their mistake, eternally stamped in God's word because of how they screwed up. Um, here's the thing. This is an accurate understanding of God knows what we're doing. <laughs> we're not getting anything by him uh, and these people are a prime example of that. You're not going to sweep something under the rug that God won't see. And the last verse is, All these had taken pagan wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. And that's how the book of Ezra closes out. But what's the point of all this? Well, we see the zeal of the people as they come back. They get discouraged partway through. When they get encouraged by a prophet of God, they actually listen. So the people are more responding than they were before the exile. They still have trouble following through consistently with God's law and God's commands. But when prompted to do so, they actually listen. Instead of turning away the prophets, they listen to the prophets and respond to their message. But then 60 years go by and Ezra comes around and Ezra is a priest and a teacher, and he leads this revival. And even though people have screwed up, and yes, the same thing happens again. They fail to follow through on God's commands. But when someone is risen up and teaches them the proper law, they respond and are repentant again. This reminds me of King David. King David was someone who screwed up consistently in his life. But when he was confronted with truth, he had a soft enough heart and a love for God to repent and turn back to God and all this was done, particularly the last four chapters, through Ezra, who was a teacher and a leader. But as a spiritual leader, 
he did three important things. He prepared his heart to understand what was written in Scripture, and he loved it. He didn't just love the Scriptures, he lived by them and set an example for those around him. And then he made the Scriptures accessible to those who would listen to him, and he taught so that others could understand and understand the love and zeal and passion he had for God's Word as well. So hopefully, we can do the same. We can be people who prepare our hearts, love God's word, live by it, and share our zeal and teach those around us why we love it so that they can experience that as well. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Uh, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this book. It is wonderful to read a book about revival and seeing three different instances of it. God, I, I think we're in, a, we're in a time where that is needed as well. So God, I pray that you would, raise, you would raise us up and you would raise others up who are willing to prepare their hearts and spend time with zeal and passion for you and your word, who will live by it and set an example for those around them and share and teach. I would pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.